Eagles Entertainment. Eagle Eye in the Sky is fueled by Gatorade, the official sports drink of the Philadelphia Eagles. Give me everything that move. I don't care who it is. Let's go. Give me everything you got. Play fast, play hard. Let's beat these boys tonight in their house. It's party time. It's party time. Let's go. Touchdown! You're listening to the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast. Now here's your host, Brand Duffy. That's right, another week, and we're getting you prepped for Eagles 49ers today as the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast, fueled by Gatorade, continues. I'm Fran Duffy, and as always, I think we've got a great show for you here on episode number 355. At the top of this week's show, we've got Chalk Talk, where I chat with my friend Ben Fennell, where we go deeper inside this Eagles home opener against the San Francisco 49ers, and we close the book on the team's week one victory over Atlanta. After Chalk Talk, Ben and I are going to transition to Scouting Report, where we focus in on a player who could be the lead back for the 49ers moving forward. That's rookie sixth-round pick Elijah Mitchell. What will he bring to the field in this matchup? We're going to break him down in that segment. Then, to close out the show, I catch up with the co-host of the Locked On 49ers podcast, a guy who's been on my shows before, Eric Crocker. He's going to join me in a segment that I'm calling Faux Focus, where we go behind enemy lines, we get the viewpoint of this matchup through their eyes from an analysis standpoint. Croc brings some great insight. He knows this 49ers squad inside and out, and I'm excited to get his perspective. Before we get there just a couple of things for from a housekeeping standpoint as always rate review subscribe if you've got a question you want to ask us about this eagles football team jump on apple podcasts or stitcher wherever you listen leave us a rating leave us a comment not only can we answer your question but it also helps us we, you know, we're right into the thick of things now in the nfl season the more you can do to help us the better it makes the show more visible to other fans of just the game and of the eagles that are looking for these podcasts so appreciate everybody that has done that lately before we get on with the rest of the show though i caught up with eagles offensive coordinator shane steichen this week over on eagles game plan it's a segment we call tape study we break down a couple of the big highlights from the previous game well coach steichen and i hit on a couple of big plays not everything made the show so i wanted to share a couple of little bits here from that segment of Eagles game plan let's hear what coach Steichen has to say very often on this show coach we talk a lot about the slot fade versus a fade that starts outside the numbers and how that gives the quarterback a little bit more room to be able to operate is that something that is talked about when you're putting something like this in yeah absolutely absolutely the slot fade is a good play for us but this one came off the pick play right here we got the look we wanted and those guys outside executed it perfectly and Jalen threw it like I said a phenomenal football up and down over the top And then you can see right there from a protection standpoint, if you rewind that, you can see right there this pickup right here, and you can see Kelsey up front right here on this one. So right here, boom, he's got this, and here comes a game up front, right? So the nose guard's coming right here to pick Brooks off, and then that guy grabs Kelsey's arm, but you can see, watch Kelsey recover right there. Come back, wind back, and hit that guy that's coming off on the loop on the stunt game right there. I mean, that's a big-time play right there to get that ball off. We talk about Kelsey's athleticism all the time in the run game and the screen game where you see those highlight blocks outside the numbers, but uh, not often you're able to point that out for us in pass protection. It was a great job by those guys up front. It's critical right here by Dallas if you let this thing play a little bit. So they're bringing pressure and they're playing cover two, which we like to call a two blitz or two dog behind it, where they're playing cloud with the corners and then the safeties have the deep half. So right here, Quez is going high. So he's an alert for us right on that high pylon. Well, that safety takes it away. And then Devontae has got that curl inside right there. But really what helps this play right here is Dallas. Okay, because Dallas is getting that chip on the outside and then going to the flat right there. And then you can see the linebacker right here. Even though he's got a cloud corner out there to help him, he still takes it a little bit, which helps that void right there for Devontae. You can see how this plays out. There's 45, boom, and then he gets stumbled up, and then it's the curl right behind it to Devontae. So well-executed play by everyone on this play. And that's the beauty of these two- and three-man route concepts is that everything works in concert together. It's not just guys running their own route. That's something that we always try to show uh, the fans at home is that everything works together in concert in the pass game. Absolutely. Takes all 11, and it was executed very well on this play. Really good job by Jalen stepping up, two hands on the football, escaping out, that good subtle movement. And then you can see right there just the throw, the ball placement by the quarterback right here. You can see right there that guy's undercutting Dallas. He stops to come back a little bit, and then he sees that. And then you can see Jalen has a feel for Dallas, throwing him open. And then great job by those guys, just the chemistry right there. Boom, jabbing his foot in the ground. Great throw and catch. Big, huge play, critical play in the game. 
And, Coach, one of the things I loved about this sequence was obviously it ends with a touchdown catch, but it was a, a well-executed two-minute drill. It started uh, back in your own territory, but that resulted from a three and out on defense, which was a plus territory punt uh, from the special team. So pure complimentary football, maybe the best in the NFL in week one. I thought this was a great example of all three phases working together. Yeah, no, it was good. Uh, whenever you can play complimentary football, offense, defense, special teams, uh, you're going to have a chance to win a lot of football games. And for that entire segment, be sure to go check out Eagles Game Plan. It'll drop Friday on PhiladelphiaEagles.com and the Eagles digital channels, or check out Tape Study, which will also go up on Friday. That's just that interview between myself and Coach Steichen. That said, uh, let's get into our analysis of this upcoming matchup against San Francisco. Let's get into Chalk Talk now with Ben Fennel. Let's get down to business. It's time for Chalk Talk. All right, well, let's kick things off here with Chalk Talk as I welcome in my friend Ben Fennel uh, to talk about the Eagles' win over Atlanta and preview Sunday's game against the San Francisco 49ers. Ben, uh, just a couple days removed from you and I watching film together uh, from the Eagles' win over Atlanta. Just uh, now we're a couple days out. Prevailing thoughts uh, on the victory here for the Eagles. Well, it was a really exciting win, obviously, to start off the Nick Sirianni era and to start off a season 1-0 after last year, losing, losing, and then having a tie to the Cincinnati Bengals. You just don't get a lot of juice in September, and it kind of sets the tone for the season. So love starting off with the win, especially the way they did it on both sides of the line of scrimmage. I mean, how many times do we say this summer, Fran, the strength of this football team is in the trenches? And pick a side, offensive side, defensive side, that's always going to give your football team a chance in every game against every opponent, no matter who's under center, no matter who's calling on the defense, no matter what your scheme is. You have a strong O-line, a strong D-line. This team, I promise you, will be in every ball game this year. Now, certain things will bounce the wrong way in second halves and will lose by double digits, and it happens. The league's tough. It's a gauntlet. But when you have strong trenches like the way this team is built, you have a fighting chance every week. And I thought week one really showed that. Yeah, I think it's a really good point on your part. And it's something that we touched on a little bit uh, here this week in Eagles game plan because uh, this Eagles offensive line, they go up against a pretty good San Francisco uh, defensive front. And the Eagles defense, obviously, uh, that front seven, they're going to be put to the test against Kyle Shanahan's offensive team. So, uh, as always, we can kind of get into just our thoughts of putting the show together. Um, I thought it was really fun to be able to put this episode uh, together because we, we both love watching the Kyle Shanahan offense and breaking down the intricacies of that scheme, right? So, um, you know, that, that part of it's fun. You're coming off an Eagles win. That makes it even more fun. Uh, we had uh, Coach Shane Steichen on. We heard from him a little bit ago here on the show. Um, I guess first things first, looking at the Eagles offense going into this game, we decided to kind of go – with that San Francisco defensive front, um, Nick Bosa, that third down package, uh, and then how the screen game can be effective against it. Just your thoughts overall on this matchup. Well, obviously, it's going to be a much different front seven. It's no secret the Falcons are in a bit of a rebuild and trying to, you know, figure out their future on the defensive front seven. This is a different week. You know, you have four first round picks on this line with Bosa, Kinlaw, Armstead, D. Ford. I think that one of the best linebackers in the NFL, Fred Warner, I think he was the highest paid at one point. Everyone keeps trumping the next guy. I think Darius Leonard is now. But anyways, really, really good front seven, much different test uh, this week. So this isn't a group I want to block all game for him. So don't try to. And you got to do things like we did this past week in kind of throwing off the rhythm and balance of the defensive line. How do you do that? misdirection, screen plays, getting the ball out quick to the perimeter, making the defense wrong with number counts. And I thought we did that or with box counts and the numbers in the box. And I thought we did a really good job in Atlanta. You know, Jalen Hurts got the ball out, didn't push the ball down the field, and it was beautiful. He let a lot of the skilled players do the dirty work. He protected himself. And I thought Nick Sirianni called it a fantastic game uh, as far as a rhythm and balance sense, sense. And when we watched it back, it was tough to get a rhythm for what we were going to throw at him. There was a misdirection, and just when you set something up, there was a screen play, screens to backs, tight ends, receivers. This team can attack you in a lot of different ways. Yeah, no question. And then that was what was most impressive, I thought, about the pass game is that nothing was too complicated. Things were well-defined, but you kept the defense on their toes. You kept them uh, guessing as to what was coming next. I thought that was a big part uh, of their success down in Atlanta, and now it's about building on that here in week number two. On the other side of the ball, Eagles defense um, going up against this Kyle Shanahan offense where they do a lot of the same things, 
it looks a little bit different, right, in terms of packaging and formations, but uh, that the same kind of principles, right, where you're trying to disguise what you're doing, you're keeping defenses on their toes, uh, and then also the, the play action element. But this is an offense that we've said for years. It's also predicated on getting the playmakers the ball fast, yards after catch, yards after catch, yards after catch. So a lot of similarities in terms of what we talk about with the scheme that's being installed here in Philadelphia and what's going on down in San Francisco. It just it comes in a different package. Yeah, you know, when Kyle Shanahan's trying to do offensively and when we watch the Niners offensive tape, some really interesting things with strength and weaknesses of the formation, shifts, motions, flipping the strength in a post-snap sense. So there's a lot of interesting schematic elements with the numbers game in the run. But Fran, I think we know Kyle Shanahan, the eye candy, the misdirection. Our linebackers are going to be stressed this week. A much different test from Arthur Smith's offense, which is much more of a vanilla, we're coming at you. You know, we're going to kind of show you something and then give you that something. Not Kyle Shanahan. He's going to have some moving parts, guys working across the green, wrinkles off of each play. So just when you saw something, now all of a sudden there's a reverse built off of it or a play action built off of it. This might be the toughest test for our linebackers in 2021 as far as our schedule is lined up. So much different tests. Alex Singleton, TJ Edwards. Eric Wilson in there, maybe a sub safety into that second level, their eye discipline is going to be really important this week. I want to go back to something you said at the top about the the switching the strength of the formation, because we saw that early for the 49ers against the Lions. And I want you to kind of paint the picture. What are we talking about What they when, when you say something like that? So obviously defenses come out, you immediately assess the offensive formation. And typically that's done with determining the strength and the weakness of the offensive formation. And that's how we line up defensively. So what I noticed for the San Francisco 49ers, particularly two of their first four plays against the Lions, which tells me this is a big aspect of our offense. This was an element we were working on in the offseason. This is an identity of our team. They would come out with a heavy strength to one side, two tight ends, the fullback also aligned to that side. What's the defense saying? The strength is over here. Then just before the snap, they do a shift. One of the fullbacks, or Kyle Juszczyk, goes to the other side of the formation. Slightly more balanced, but the strength is still the strength. Then at the snap, the tight end goes in jet motion. So all of a sudden, you had three extra blockers to the right. At the snap of the ball, two of those are now to the left-hand side. If the defense didn't account for the shifts and the motions, you're outgunned just based off strength and weaknesses. If you lined up to the strength and put some extra soldiers on that side, it's all of a sudden a weak side run right now, and they may have the numbers advantage. The run game in the NFL, and on Saturdays for the most part, is a numbers game. And I really think that's one of the aspects that the general fan doesn't understand and pick up when watching games or studying the game is the numbers aspect of the run game. And it's so important in setting up those numbers and flipping numbers in a post-snap sense. And we saw it early on with Atlanta. There were a couple shifts that they did just before the snap as well. And you saw the Eagles, they kind of countered to that and had guys moving as well. You had the Sam linebacker, Jannard Avery and Derek Barnett literally switching sides uh, as the shift was happening. And now we didn't really see that as much as the game went on. So I wonder with well, how will the Eagles handle some of these shifts when it's thrown their way? Will you see them completely flip their defensive front or Will you see guys just kind of slide over and, and everybody kind of goes in prepared? Look, on any given play, we might line up where you're the Sam backer, you're the strong side defensive end, you're the weak side defensive end. But if they shift, now you're just going to have to slide down and you're going to change your technique. And now you're the strong side player. And now the other guy's the weak side player. And that'll be something to watch. But I'm glad that you kind of were able to break that down for us. Uh, let's take a look at this 49ers team. And obviously one of the big topics of discussion for them is going to be the quarterback situation. It's going to be something that hangs over this team as the season continues on, you trade three first round picks to take Trey Lance at number three overall. You know, people are going to be wondering when is he going to play? So my, th- I want to get your thoughts on Jimmy Garoppolo, Trey Lance, this dynamic, how long does it last in its current form? You know, I, I think that's a guessing game for all of us. I think we will see more and more Trey Lance as the season goes on more specific packages and making opponents prepare for Trey Lance's presence. And they came right out. I think his first snap was a quarterback draw. So incorporating that run game. And that was something Kyle Shanahan said in February. He said, having the threat, the possibility of quarterback run. And Fran, that told me everything I need to know about who the Niners were going to get at number three. It wasn't going to be Mac Jones. 
He wanted the threat and the illusion of quarterback run. Not to say he's going to run Trey Lance into a brick wall and hurt his young quarterback. Maybe probably not the power concepts that, you know, uh, Josh Allen was running or Carson Wentz early uh, in his career here, but just the threat of it. And that makes defenses then prepare for it, spend time during the week. And that's all you want to do. So I think we'll see more and more Trey Lance. And Jimmy G played an outstanding game on Sunday. I think that was a through and through Jimmy G game. And what do I mean by that? I think you go right to some really fun PFF metrics, Fran. They have two that I like. Big time throws, turnover worthy throws. Jimmy G had zero of both. And that's what Jimmy G does. He's not going to take risks. He's not going to take those chances. He's not going to put the ball in harm's way. But you won't reap you won't reap the benefits of taking some risks too. So I think that's what you get with Jimmy G. He's going to protect the ball, but he's a little boring. And I think that's why you're looking for some more juice in that offense. That's why you're looking for a quarterback. That's why you're trying to figure out why is this team not winning Super Bowls? What's holding us back? It might be that quarterback spot. So I think we'll slowly see a more transition into Trey Lance. But Jimmy G is more than capable starter. Uh, do, am I correct in remembering? Because we, we talked about that stat yesterday as we were watching a film. You were pulling numbers. Was Jimmy G the only quarterback in the NFL to, to have zero of both in week one? There were some that had zero turnover or zero big, big time. He was the only one to have zero in both those categories. Right. But that's, that's such a Jimmy G thing. Right. He's, just, yep. he's just boring. But I got news for you. There are a lot of coaches around the league that love boring from the quarterback spot. Right. Because that gives us a chance. It's not hurting our team with taking risks and things like that. I mean, look at the way Jameis played with the Tampa Bay Bucks for his first five years in his career. They were, they were dying for something boring at the quarterback position in Tampa Bay. So having that live wire, you make some plays, you get throw for 30 touchdowns, you might throw 30 picks too, like Jameis did his last year in Tampa. Staying with this offense, you know, obviously a big ta- a big com- uh, point of conversation, Elijah Mitchell stepping in pot- potentially to be the primary ball carrier here uh, in this offense. We're going to get to him here in a little bit. But uh, this is a scheme that for years and years and years, going back to – the Denver Broncos and Mike Anderson and Orlandis Gary, obviously Terrell Davis being uh, a Super Bowl MVP. This is a scheme where they are able to just plug running backs in and find success. So I want to ask you, what is it that makes this scheme go in your mind? Why, for, for the fans out there uh, that haven't done this deep dive, what is it that allows these running backs to come in and find instant success? So you, people play fantasy football. It's like, oh, I, you, you plug the 49ers running back into your, into your starting lineup, you figure you're, that's a pretty safe bet. You're going to get points. I think it's because they have a true identity and they have a true foundational scheme. The, the Shanahan tree, which is now McFay and LaFleur, and there's a bunch of influences around the NFL, are what I call foundational schemes in that we have a foundational system based on the run game. And that's a outside zone, stretch zone based run game. So anytime you have an identity, you have a core concept, you have a foundation then you can find players that excel at that foundation. I would not look at Kyle Shanahan or McVay or LaFleur and be like, these guys are extremely multiple. No, I mean, Sean McVay went to the Super Bowl running 11 personnel 98% of the times that season. These are not multiple teams. They may have players that can execute multiple skill sets like George Kittle and Kyle Juszczyk are incredible two-way players. But his offensive sense is not multiple. And that's good in a sense as well, because you could be very defined in what you're running and then attack players that fit that role and fit that type of scheme. If you're a team that wants to run inside zone, outside zone, misdirection stuff, oh, then we have the power stuff. We have, you know, counter power and all those gap scheme runway back stuff. And then, you know, then you need players that excel. in It's tough to find a well-rounded back that looks good in every scheme, Fran. It's hard to do. So I think anytime you have a true identity on offense, you could then say, let's go find guys that fit that identity. I know it sounds kind of dumb and, you know, so easy. Simplistic, right, yeah. Just saying it, I'm almost like putting myself to sleep. Well, no kidding. If he runs outside zone, go find a, <laughs> a runner that excels in outside zone. Okay, then, don't run power 12 times a game for that guy. You have to have that coordinator then accept what he does, and th- this is who we are as a team defensively uh, very kind of, I don't want to say vanilla, but a very basic outlook, what we saw here in week number one. Do you, what do you think this identity is going to be moving forward? Do you feel, feel like what we saw in week one is who they are going to be? Or do you think it was just kind of a week one, you know, this is a sense of we're just kind of getting our feet wet in the new system? 
Eagles defense or Niners defense? Not for the 49ers defense. Sorry, I should have been more clear with that. I mean, I th- I think a lot of the defenses and some of the best ones are becoming more more boring. And it, it didn't look all that exotic. It didn't look that creative. And the best defenses around the NFL aren't that exotic and creative, whether it's Buffalo or Indy or Tampa or uh, Pittsburgh's doing some exotic stuff with their front. Tampa is too. But anyways, um, when you have really good players at spots like the Niners do, especially in their front seven, don't overthink it. Now, they incorporate a lot of stunts and games up front, not a lot of blitzing, not a lot of exotic post-snap rotation, but that's okay. When I have Fred Warner and Nick Bosa and D. Ford coming off the bench and Arik Armstead can play defensive end on the drop of a hat, I'm not overthinking it. So, in my opinion, Fran, it was a little vanilla, but appropriately so. And that's what you and I have talked about this here on the show. I know early in the offseason when people were wondering what the Eagles' defensive scheme was, and it's like, When I look around the league and you see the defensive identities and schemes and how people use their personnel, I almost look at it like, look, where is your where is your strength from a personnel standpoint? Is it in the front or is it in the back? Wherever your strength is not, that's where you want to be complicated. Hey, if you're if we have a dominant defensive front, let's let those guys win their one on ones. Right. And then we're going to be a little bit more complicated on the back end. If your horses are in the secondary. You know what? You got the ability to just say, we're going to line up and play man to man coverage. You're the Miami Dolphins. You've got all these three, you know, the highly paid corners, and you've got these safeties that can match up. You could do lots of things there. All right, cool. Well, now we're going to be really multiple up front and do lots of different things from a stunt and blitz standpoint and personnel packages and all those different things. You could be more multiple. So I'm interested to see as this scheme continues to develop, what are some of the things that they can do? to help those corners on the back end. Because obviously that is uh, what what a lot of people would say is the weak point of that defense. That's exactly what I was about to say. I don't think it's any secret that the front is so dominant by default. The the back end is the concern and particularly the corners. I think we both like Jimmy Ward and Jarquiski Tart at safety, really nice players. Kawan Williams is a nice nickel. Yep. Jason Barrett's injured again. They're already having some issues at corner. Don't ask them to play man to man and take risks and have to turn and run. Play soft, keep it in front of you. The old GTFB defense, get the F back for, for fans listening at home there. Keep it in front of you. And I think that's what you're going to see from the Niners. And I think that's what we saw on tape week one a lot of cover three, a lot of zone, and just keep it in front. And I think, you know, that's the formula a lot of teams are going through, whether it's those zone teams I had mentioned on you know on Sundays or even some of the elite defenses on Saturdays like Nick Saban starting to play more zone coverage saying let's just keep it in front of us because allowing explosive plays and getting our corners beat down the field that hurts the defense so if we could keep it in front of us slow bleed that offense they're going to make the mistake before we do let's real quickly before we transition to scouting report go through some matchups that matter and I'll stay on this side of the ball in this matchup Eagles offensive line especially that interior trio the guard center guard against the 49ers defensive tackles, because what did we see on both sides of the coin here in this matchup in week one? Ben, you and I, time and time again, we saw these double teams, namely with Jason Kelsey and Isaac Samalo, but you can go across the board. We know uh, what the rest of the Seagulls offensive front can do at the point of attack with some of these double teams in the run game, right at the point of attack. And then when you look at the other side, Detroit, I mean, Jamal Williams had himself a day getting downhill because that offensive line for the Lions, which is a pretty good group, They got some good movement on the interior. No Javon Kinlaw. He was out with a knee injury uh, this past week. His status as of this recording still up in the air. So they were able to get some movement against those San Francisco defensive tackles. And and to me, that's an area where, all right, if the Eagles can get things going on the ground, I think that would be a big reason why. Well, I think it's a pretty crazy thought that, you know, Outland award-winning left tackle Penny Sewell looked pretty good at left tackle. Good look at a left tackle. Maybe that would be the position he's played his whole life. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. um, So... (laughs) Uh, but I'm going to go on the other side of the ball, San Francisco's offense here. Friend. And what do we talk about George Kittle, his two-way ability blocking? He gives this offense incredible, incredible flexibility with his ability to single block defensive ends. So my matchup to watch this week, I want to see Josh Sweat, Derek Barnett, whoever, you know, Brandon Graham, who's ever at edge, make Kittle pay for single blocks. And after watching last week and Josh Sweat and, you know, go check out the YouTube clip, 16 minutes of all 22 breakdowns on YouTube. There's a six play package on Josh Sweat. Those final three plays are as violent plays, setting the edge in the run game, ragdoll and tight ends, as you'll see in the NFL over the weekend. So Josh Sweat, George Kittle, that's going to be a really good matchup. That'll be a fun one for us to watch uh, on Monday morning for sure. All right, Ben, let's uh, let's transition into this segment. We talked about how we're going to break down Elijah Mitchell in our scouting report. 
All right, Ben, let's take a look at the rookie sixth round pick out of Louisiana, Elijah Mitchell, the running back who led the 49ers in rushing a week ago, a little bit by surprise, right? Because everybody kind of viewed Trey Sermon as that number two back behind Raheem Mostert. Uh, Trey Sermon, a, a surprise inactive, a healthy inactive for the 49ers in week one. So now Mitchell steps in and, and he was the lead ball carrier here for San Francisco after Mostert went out. He goes for 100 yards, over 100 yards. He goes for that long touchdown. I would love to, for the two of us to kind of go through our notes uh, on this kid and kind of compare what we both saw from him uh, down there at Louisiana. Yeah, really productive player, interesting player. And, um, you know, when I'm starting to put together his body of work, this really isn't a surprise at this point. So I'm just going to go through the gauntlet of my notes here. About 5'10", 210, ran 4'3", 3 with 31-inch arms. I didn't see that type of speed on tape. Also, the arms are a little bit on the short side. It's a guy that led his team in rushing the final two years at Louisiana, over 500 carries in his career, 3,200 yards. So he's a obviously a productive runner, carry the ball a lot, 6.2 per carry on 500 carries. That's incredibly productive with a high volume and only four fumbles. And then when you start to peel back more players, prolific high school running back and returner, you always want a guy that sets his high school rushing record. There's just one of those things that scouts look for. Are you setting records at your high school? 49 receptions, only three drops, caught the ball really well all in his career at Louisiana. Nice downfield catch at the senior bowl practice down the seam. It was like a 30 yard catch over his shoulder. I forgot about that. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That was a big time play. His tape at Louisiana, I mean, this was a dominant offensive line with Robert Hunt and Kevin Dotson, both starters in the NFL right now, slashing zone runner. He's a one-cut type, huge outside zone type of offense. I think 95% of his runs were zone scheme, great vision, gets efficient yards, square to the line of scrimmage type of guy. I don't know if he's high cut or if he just runs upright, but his pad level wasn't always great. He would take some big hits at times. But he's got strong legs, strong lower half, but he's not a creative or loose player. And I didn't see that home run tape. And Fran, when you look at his career, I mean, his final three years, which is when he was a starter, 84 runs of 10 yards. Wow. That's a lot. It's a lot. He's right up there with all the who's who of college football. But only 22 of those went for 20 yards. So what does that tell me? He's productive. He's efficient. But maybe not that, not, not that home run juice in the open field. Maybe not that creativity in the open field. So the 4-3-3, three, three, I thought, had a little bit of an asterisk saying, I didn't really see that. Then you go back further, 2018, he played Alabama, Fran. He had 12 for 93 yards. All I'm going to say is he looked the part against SEC defenders out there. He was not shy. 2019, he had 1,000 yards, 16 touchdowns. That sounds pretty good, right? He's split time with Trey Regis and Raymond right. Yep. He might have he might have hit 2000 yards if he didn't have those guys and then he maybe would have been a higher coveted prospect, maybe a day 2 player, and next thing you know everybody knows who Elijah Mitchell is. So, that's kind of my gauntlet of information there on Mitchell. Well, I'm glad you kind of emptied the notebook there because I, I saw a lot of the same things. I also on tape didn't see special athletic traits and then he goes uh to his pro day in the spring and just blows it up. I did not see the 433 I'll tell you what, uh, he showed some juice uh, this past week against the Detroit Lions as well. We talked about the long touchdown run, but uh, he showed some of that breakaway speed there. And I just, I really loved his feel for riding the wave as a stretch zone runner. I thought he had a really, really good knack uh, for, you know, being a really good runner in those zone schemes, uh, sticking his foot in the ground. You talked about his one cut nature. I, I thought that he had a really, really good natural feel for that. So, you know, at the, you talked earlier in the show about how this scheme, they target guys that are good fits. To me, you look at what well, we talked about, Elijah Mitchell, pretty good fit for, for what they do uh, down in San Francisco. So I think that that uh, made a whole ton of sense when he was picked by them in the sixth round, despite trading up for Sherman uh, earlier. That's what I thought was interesting. You, so essentially, they spent three picks on running backs in this draft. Uh, but that I think that speaks to how well they thought Mitchell fit into this offense. Yeah, you know, Trey Sermon may have a little bit more juice and a little bit more exciting, but Elijah Mitchell is just that boring guy that's not going to fumble to get the dirty yards that you just can't take off the field. And when you're comparing guys on the practice field, he's one of those that just doesn't disappoint the coaches. And I don't know if you remember, Fran, he was one of my one-play takeaways last year on the Journey to the Draft podcast. Why? Because he had a, a game early in the season where he had two touchdowns, both outside zone. One, he took it up the inside. One, he cut back to the outside. I just love seeing that in-out combo of the same running scheme. And what do you get with the 49ers? Outside zone, outside zone, outside zone. So I'm right there with you. Finding a guy that fits your identity, it's the name of the game. 
That's uh, why you should be subscribed to the Journey to the Draft podcast. You would have known all about Elijah Mitchell uh, a year ago at this time. Well, Ben, we'll break it all down next week right here on the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast. Make sure you go follow Ben on Twitter at Ben Fennel underscore NFL. Ben, we'll talk to you later, man. Well, great stuff from Ben, who you can follow him on Twitter, just like I do, at Ben Fennel underscore NFL. And while you're at it, I'm at Eagles XOs. That's where I post all the podcasts I'm a part of and all of our X's and O's content that we produce here with Eagles Entertainment. You know how much I appreciate everybody that promotes this podcast on social media. That is one way to support the show. But the best way, like I always say, is to go on to Apple Podcasts or Stitcher, leave us a rating, leave us a comment. If you've got a question, we will answer it. Appreciate everybody that has done that lately. That said, let's get going here with this show. We've got one more interview to get to. It's time to hit on Faux Focus with Eric Crocker. We've got our new segment, Faux Focus. Let's get into that conversation now with Eric Crocker talking about this 49ers team and how they view the Eagles going into week two. What's this matchup look like from the other side? It's time to find out in Faux Focus. All right, well, this week here on Full Focus, excited to welcome in former NFL defensive back Eric Crocker. You can follow him on Twitter at Eric underscore Crocker. He's the co-host of the Locked On 49ers podcast. Eric, welcome to the show, man. Oh, man, thanks for having me on. All right, well, let's talk through this 49ers team because obviously they, they start the season 1-0, high expectations, a lot of intrigue around this team, uh, especially after the injuries they suffered a year ago. So now you get people healthy. What's the biggest strength for this 49ers team? I guess we'll start on the offensive side of the ball. Biggest strength going into this week two matchup against the Eagles. What if you're if you're Kyle Shanahan? What gives you confidence in their ability to win this game on offense? I think the fact that I'm Kyle Shanahan, <laughs> he's our, he's our like biggest it. asset. You yeah. know, um, you know, aside from him, I think just the philosophy of the 49ers is to run the ball well and have things work off of the run. I think that kind of takes a little bit off of the quarterback who. At times, you know, he he can he can be on, and there's other times where he can do some weird things. But I think Kyle Shanahan's offense makes it to where it doesn't have to be about the quarterback and his position starting quarterback, Jimmy Garoppolo. And Kyle Shanahan, just the way that he makes – he uh, works off of the run action, you know, the way he sets everything up off of that, I think that's probably, like, the biggest strength. And the offensive line is kind of built to run block. And uh, as we saw even, you know, last week, once the 49ers get the run game running, uh, rolling early, that definitely helps everything else open up down the stretch. I mean, as a defensive player, like, I just what are, what are the headaches like uh, when you're preparing for an offense like this? I, I think the biggest thing is he makes everything look like the same. So he'll he'll do something and he'll show you something, and it's almost like to, uh, wanting a kid to take a piece of candy, and it's like. The moment you reach for that candy, he does the opposite of what he thinks you're gonna, uh, what you think he's gonna do. And I think that's where he really hurts guys. Mm-hmm. And Jimmy Garoppolo is not like a big play quarterback in the sense of him generating the big plays, but the offense definitely still is explosive because of the matchups that Kyle Shanahan knows how to exploit. I think one thing that he does extremely well is understand defensive players' rules and understand how to work off of that to mm-hmm. put that player in a specific box. Yeah, so attacking different guys in zone coverage and saying, all right, this is good. You know, we're going to target the, the hook player in the middle of the field. We know that he's responsible for this area. We're going to give him some, give him one thing, take him out of that zone, and then attack the void. Exactly, yep. And he, he's really good at that. I think that's probably maybe one of his biggest strengths. All right. So, and you mentioned you know Jimmy Garoppolo and, and, not, and him not necessarily being a big play quarterback, but – Trey Lance, that was the that was the idea with going after a guy like that with his skill set right now. Uh, the way that he's being used in this offense right now, kind of a specialty package player. How long we talked about this earlier with Ben? How long do you envision that being the case? At what point do you feel like uh, a switch is made? No, I think a lot of it. There, there's two things here, man. In this yeah. stuff, I heard Steve Young kind of talk about it before the season even started, and he was like, "Look, if Jimmy Garoppolo starts off playing well and he's winning games, it's going to be really hard." To replace him, you're going to put yeah. yourself in a sticky situation. I think ideally what Kyle Shanahan would like is to see that at some point uh, Trey Lance can come in and he can run the offense efficiently and take the offense to the next level with the big play ability that he has. But in preseason, we saw the big play ability. We, we saw that on several occasions. We saw the big time throws he can make, the, the plays he can make on the move. But then we also saw some inconsistencies in his play. And I think for the 49ers, they're not in a situation like – the Jets or the Jaguars, where it's like, you know what? We can just live and die regardless of if our quarterback, like Trevor Lawrence, threw three touchdowns but three interceptions as well, and we're losing. 49ers are a team that probably have really high expectations. So it's like, you know, we can kind of ease 
our our young quarterback Trey Lance in, and the way we can kind of ease him in, still get him in the game, still give him those live reps, and see the speed of the game. That's a big difference going from FCS to the NFL. Well, let's get him in on the goal line and have him throw a touchdown on the first drive right. of the season. Uh, get him in a couple of times um, and let him see the run actions and kind of get used to the decision making and reading things at full speed, which he definitely looks like he needs to improve on, but. All those will transition into him getting more and more looks and them being able to do more and more off of that and just kind of keep going on on, uh, Trey Lance a little bit. There was no real game plan for him week one. I don't know if a lot of it was because, you know, he missed. He was injured, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he missed some time at practice because of his finger, had a chip on his finger. So I don't think they really incorporated him into a game plan. Kyle Shanahan just kind of threw him in there a little bit just to get him a few reps. I'm interested to see with his finger probably now fully recovered, whatever chip that was that he had going on, how does Kyle Shanahan game plan Mm. for Philadelphia? How does he incorporate Trey Lance in that? Because I think it would be different than what we saw. And and that's the thing. I mean, you talked about how uh, he has been so good, Kyle Shanahan, at at disguising his intentions, showing you one thing, giving you something else. When you have that quarterback as a dynamic runner in the the backfield, that adds like layer upon layer upon layer of what you're doing in the run game. And with the play action pass game, it, it, it just it makes it that much more difficult to stop. And that's where we'll make it fun for guys like us that uh, that love going through the film. Once once Lance is in the starting lineup, it's going to be a real a lot of fun, even more fun than normal to watch that offensive scheme. It'll it'll be a lot of fun for sure. Yeah, and, and the cool thing I think for the 49ers, even though for the fans and people covering the 49ers, you know, we're excited to see the young guy get in, but they're they're in a position where they don't have to rush him on the field. And, and right. one thing we did see from the young guys. The three quarterbacks that did start as rookies, they all lost. Yep. And the 49ers don't want to be in a situation where they're taking early lumps because they're out there, you know, throwing the guy, throwing out a quarterback who essentially isn't 100% ready to be able to fully functionally run the offense. Let's go to the, uh, the other side of the football. Defensively, biggest strength with this unit, uh, the biggest area of confidence for you guys going into this matchup against the Eagles. I think the front seven. Um, they're really good. Now, there, there were some moments in the game, and, and Sanders might be licking his chops at this, where they had some gashing, gaping holes, that, and they're going to have to figure that out. Part of it could be there was no Javon Kenlaw in the middle. Yep. Uh, another part of it could be that the 49ers run wide nine, and the defensive line is taught to really get upfield right now. And the linebackers, and we saw Greenlaw do this. You'll see it doing a few times, actually. He, he'd kind of pick a side, and you can't pick a side. you got to take that lineman square on and then let your other backer kind of feel. But once you pick a side, it creates this big gaping hole that we saw 49ers uh, kind of give up a few times. So the, the, the front is the strength of the team, but they definitely need to improve in that aspect. When you look at the back end, and obviously with the, with the Jason Verrett injury, which you hate to see um, with after the year that he had last year, what, what is it that they – first of all, who are the players that you expect to take the field uh, at corner uh, going into this matchup? Obviously, you have Williams inside in the slot. We saw the rookie, Diamondor Lenore from Oregon. Uh, he had the one starting spot. Who do you anticipate being the other starter, and who are they going to rely on here, not just here in week two, but moving down the stretch? I think it's going to be – they're going to first, they're going to see how is Emmanuel Mosley doing. Is he yeah. healthy? If Mosley isn't healthy enough to play, it's never an ideal situation to be – playing without your two starting cornerbacks. Yep. But if Mosley isn't able to play, and obviously Verrett, he's lost for the year, I'd assume they're going to look to either uh, uh, D- uh, Dante Johnson or Josh Norman. Mm. I-, I-, I would lean more towards Josh Norman. Right. But, you know, D- Dante Johnson, he's been there, been there for the last few years. I mean, spent most of his career with the 49ers, left, uh, had a brief stint with a couple other teams one year. But – he knows everything that the 49ers want to do. He's been there the entire time. So I, I think they might lean towards him, but there could be an opportunity to, to get Josh Norman in, who they just signed. Uh, a couple of years. They were the, the biggest quarters team in the NFL a year ago uh, with Robert Sala as the defensive coordinator. Week one under D'Amico Ryan's heavy influence on cover three. Uh, we saw a lot of single high uh, zone coverage here from the 49ers. Do you feel like that will be their identity on the back end uh, moving forward here? Oh, man, I think they're going to mix it up. I mean, it could be something. One thing about Robert Sala, even though he ran more quarters, I, I thought he did a terrific job of of really playing to, you know, whatever it is that the strength of the other team is. Like, he, he wasn't just too stubborn to be like, you know what, I came from the Seattle's cover three scheme, so that that's just all we're going to run. Seattle cover three, Seattle cover three all the time. 
he actually transitioned into being a more versatile defense. They definitely ran more quarters. Um, we're able to keep things in front of them. I don't know if maybe some of that had to do with all the edge rushers that they were missing. I mean, the 49ers right. pretty much lost every edge rusher that they had last year with Nick Bosa, D Ford, uh, Zico Ansa. I mean, uh, 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 Thomas Solomon, Tom, the list goes on and on. They just continue to lose their edge rushers early and often. And they had to probably figure out a different way to kind of help keep plays in front of them and not give up big plays. When, when you're running this the cover three scheme and you have a good pass rush, you can do that because the, the rush gets there now. They lacked that last year. So I'm interested to see if uh, uh, if D'Amico Ryans maybe does more game planning and adjusting to the teams that he's playing against or to his personnel. Maybe if he does things a little different because he doesn't have Barrett and the Mos- uh, uh, Emmanuel Mosley out there now. Okay, well, we got a rookie. We got to protect him. We have Dante Johnson or Josh Norman. We have to protect him, uh, you know, but – you also have that front that plays well and, and is able to consistently get pressure on quarterbacks. So maybe that'll kind of ease that transition to anything that he's forced into doing. Croc, we've got one more question for you. You've been so generous uh, with your time so far. Most pivotal matchup on Sunday in your mind, either side of the ball, uh, which, which of these matchups do you feel like will be most important towards the final result of this game? I, I think it's definitely on the, on the defensive side of the ball, for the 49ers and the offensive side of the ball for the Philadelphia Eagles. The 49ers are, again, shorthanded a little bit on the defensive side of the ball. Like, do they have somebody that can legitimately all game cover Smith, Devontae yeah. Smith? You know, I think the world is Devontae Smith. I loved him coming out of college, was my wide receiver one, and without a doubt. I think he flashed some of that ability in the first game, catching the uh, pass down the left sideline for a touchdown. He had big playability, he was a terrific route runner. And with the 49ers cornerbacks that they're kind of slated to have out there, they typically, they're not really guys that mirror and match a guy like uh, Smith and his strengths very well. So how would they defend him? And then, you know, Rager can't give up the screens and the big plays to him. I saw his touchdown. And then obviously a quarterback that's able to make off scripted plays. How do you kind of bottle him up and not really make him, let him get outside the pocket? Can you, can you keep him in that pocket? Are you uh, disciplined in your, uh, defense on the line. I saw a few times when uh, Jared Goff did these big bootleg actions and we'd have the end just crash down and just totally disregard Jared Goff, who still has the ball in his boot. Now, you can't do that against Jalen Hurts. They'll end up hurt you in that way. So I think really just the two matchups, the, the, your receivers against uh, defensive backs, who I think might have a hard time covering those type of, those style of receivers. And then Will the 49ers be disciplined and being able to kind of hmm. condense everything for uh, Hertz and making him play from the pot? It'll, it'll be a lot of fun to break down. Make sure you go check out uh, Eric Crocker, Locked On 49ers podcast. And for the people that listen to this show, you know that I'm a big fan of the NFL draft. I, co- I have the Journey of the Draft podcast. Well, Croc uh, just recently announced he's going to be one of the new co-hosts here for the Locked On NFL Draft podcast. Croc, congratulations on that, by the way. Uh, make sure you go subscribe uh, to both of Eric's shows. Croc, thanks so much, man. We'll talk to you soon. I appreciate it, man. Anytime. Well, outstanding stuff there from Croc. Hope you guys enjoyed that interview. Hope you guys are enjoying this new series here on the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast. Before we wrap up today's show, uh, I told you earlier, we always are going to try and leave some of these clippings from the cutting room floor for Eagles game plan this week. Some great analysis. I just can't squeeze it all into a 20-minute show. So... All those those leftovers, I'm going to drop them right here at the end of this late week episode of the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast. So we get some analysis here from John Clark, Ike Reese, Mike Quick, Greg Cosell, that due to time constraints, couldn't squeeze in, but I kept it all for you. Let's go to that now. And speaking of the passing game, uh, the 49ers defense, they've given up the fewest passing yards over the last three years in the NFL, but they're a little banged up. Jason Verrett, probably their best cornerback out for the year. They've got some injuries, so can you attack them in the secondary? Yeah, guys, with all of the injuries that they're dealing with, you have to take advantage of that. It happened to them last week. As soon as the cornerback went out, you saw the line start to attack them. And I think if they're going to play any type of man coverage on the outside, the Eagles have to take advantage of that because of the skilled wide receivers that the Eagles have. Yeah, you're right. He had that dog mentality. Now, it was a tough start. They gave up a lot of yards of those first two drives, but the rest of the game, they only gave up 114 yards to the Falcons. How impressive was that? The rest of the game, they just dominated the football game. They dominated the line of scrimmage, and that's what you have to have from the defense. It makes the back end so much better the way they played. Early in the game, though, you saw the cutback very effective. They would run that outside zone type of play, 
and then the running back cutting it back against the grain, and they were burned on that a couple of times, but they got better. They started to fill those gaps. They started to set the edges on both sides and just play more effective defense. They controlled the line of scrimmage on both sides of the ball. That, to me, is the difference in the football game. So this is a very simple concept that the 49ers run quite often. They get to it in many different ways. Garoppolo will boot right, he will boot left. Kittle could be on the same side or the opposite side, but this is something you must defend because Kittle, when he catches these balls, has room to run. And there may be no better tight end running after the catch in the NFL than George Kittle. So this is just one really important element in this matchup between the 49ers offense and the Eagles defense that must be defended. What happens is Josh Sweat recognizes this at the snap of the ball, and instead of waiting for the running back and the tight end to come over to kick him out, he attacks it. He goes across the line of scrimmage, jacks Hayton Hurst up under those shoulder pads, stuffs the run game, and it allows for Darius Slay to eventually come up and make this tackle on the outside. That's good team defense. Mike talked about this a little bit ago about the cutback runs that happened against the Eagles last week. Well, a lot of that was due to not trusting your teammates and staying in your proper gaps. On that play right there, you get Darius Slay trusting Josh Sweat to go up and do his job. Josh Sweat makes the ball bounce. Darius Slay is there to make the tackle. That's good team run defense. All right, speaking of good defense, I mean, when you have this guy, George Kittle, last year he had 15 catches for 183 yards against the Eagles, <laughs> even though the Niners lost, but he's got the most yards ever by a tight end in his first three seasons. How do you defend this guy? Who are you going to put on him? Do you have to hit him at the line of scrimmage? How do you slow him down? He's just so hard to defend. He's one of the best, if not the best, tight end in all of football. You mentioned the 15 catches in the last year's game against him. He only had 15 targets, <laughs> and he caught 15 <laughs> targets. <targets. laughs> he is a nightmare, but you can't take your eyes off of Devo Samuel. If you look at Samuel last week, he had 189 yards receiving. They are a complete offense. They've got two good receivers on the outside. They run the ball well. They had some rookie come in out of Louisiana College last week who ran for 104 yards. Wow. They are a talented bunch, so you have to be well-disciplined. And like Ike said, in the run game, you have to make sure that you're fitting all of those gaps and not leaving anything open. And again, be sure to check out Eagles Game Plan. That goes up Friday digitally across all Eagles channels. Or if you live in the Philadelphia area, make sure you go check it out live, NBC 10 at 10 a.m. Sunday morning. It's a great way to get started on game day. Great stuff from everybody on the show this week. Ben Fennel, uh, we have obviously had Greg Cosell earlier this week. Eric Crocker joining us here in today's episode as well. Great stuff, as always. We're getting you ready for Eagles 49ers in Week 2. We'll be back early next week, myself and Greg, breaking down what we see from the film on Monday night. So be sure to stay subscribed right here on the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast. That being said, I think that'll do it. Another show in the books here on the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast, fueled by Gatorade. For everybody here at the Novacare Complex, I am Fran Duffy. We will talk to you next week.